This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 264 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show, Below the Equator and Gina Miles. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Our sponsors this week are Aquasketch and Kentucky Performance Products. You can find them at kppusa.com. Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the Stable, it's every week. They'll bring you the news through hail or hot water, while using their tails as their own fly swatters. Sit on down and laugh till your poop Cause it's time again for Stable Scoop Stable Scoop Stable Scoop Stable Scoop This is Glenn the Geek And this is Helena B And you're listening to the Stable Scoop Radio Show On the Horse Radio Network Well howdy Helena Howdy, Glenn. How you doing? Good. We had a fine time over the weekend. We got to go meet some of our new neighbors, and I'll post the uh, pictures on our Stable Scoop Facebook page. We have uh, neighbors that just live three or four uh, farms down, and we got to go meet them. But more importantly, they were very nice people, but we got to meet their new additions, a two-day and a five-day-old mini donkey. I saw the picture. Aren't they you. cute? Oh my god! <laughs> I didn't think there was a time where I wasn't quite sure if baby equines were cute. You know, they're all spindly and leggy and stuff like that. And then, of course, you, the more you play with them, the more you realize they're the cutest things ever. But the baby donkey, but mini don- mini down. baby donkeys, <laughs> and they're so soft. One was soft. Wait. There was a black one, and then there was a, a white and black polka dotted one. And, you know, they stood, you know, what, tw- 20 inches high, maybe. Um, and, and they were just so soft and friendly. I've never seen foals so friendly as these two would just come up to you, and then they would play a little, and then they'd come up to you and rub all over you like a dog. It was so funny. Do they call them foals? They call baby donkeys I don't foals? know. I don't know what I figured. Doesn't it seem a little weird? Like I know. I figured they're, that- like, they're like equines, so I, what else would you call them? I don't know. Um mm-hmm. But they were cute as the Dickens and so, so friendly. We just had we had a blast playing with them. We must have been over there an hour just playing with them. I would be, too. I would have them move in. I'd make them a bed. And I didn't make a peep. Mom and mom, both moms were really good about it. And apparently they, it was, they had the, I don't know if they had the same dad or not. Um, they didn't really say. But, but the people were very nice to let us hang around and just pet them for an hour. <laughs> they said so, people have been stopping along the road to take pictures. And uh, a couple of people actually uh, uh, would drive down their driveway and ask if they could go see them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've had people stop at my fence because my, my front pasture's on the road. And, you know, I, I kind of welcome that. I thought that I wouldn't, you know. I can understand how some people would be put off by just strangers driving down their driveways wanting to see their animals. And it's an invasion of privacy for sure. But um, I don't know. There's a part of me that thinks that's pretty cool. Like, but it's also course, good for the industry, you know, for people to be interested in them. Totally. Yeah. I think so. I think so, too. So that was that was one of our highlights for the for the weekend. I got to drive PT. We ground drove him again, PT Scooter, and he was excellent. He didn't make a wrong step the entire time. He was so good. Oh, what a good boy! So we're well, I'm working on a cart and harness now, so we can start driving him a little more seriously now that he's gaining a little weight and looking a little better. Now, when you say we, you mean Jen? Jen, right? yes, yep. <laughs> Jen, oh, this is as much Jennifer's pony as mine. She spends a lot of time hanging out with this pony. She loves this little pony. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer's not much of a pony person, but this guy is a kind of a neat little attitude. So she said that he's really won her over. Yeah, she, he has actually, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised because she, you know, she hasn't liked all of my ponies in the past, especially my Hackney ponies. So <laughs> <laughs> this Hackney has uh, has got her ticket. Hey, before we go on with the show, we just this has nothing to do with horses, but amazing people, and that is that we're recording this on Tuesday. 
Diana Nyad finished her her swim yesterday, her 110 miles from Cuba to Florida, and her fifth attempt over 35 years to do this without a shark cage, and and accomplished it a day early after 53 hours in the ocean. Now you love the ocean. Can yes. you imagine this? <laughs> no, no, I can't. I don't want. I don't want anything to swim up and bite me in the hiney. <laughs> well, and of course that's why her other swims had been cut short. It's be- not because of sharks, because of jellyfishes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yuck. Yeah. I, you know, I love, I'll eat things from the ocean <laughs> and I will swim in the ocean. I just don't want things biting me. Yeah. You know. Well, you know, it's not so much biting, you know, obviously they're For the most part, they're going to leave you alone. It's the, I think I watch too many scary movies. Like, <laughs> and it's not just Jaws, but like the deep and the abyss. And yep. I, I don't the know why. The perfect storm. Do you know, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, hey, I give her credit. I, I think the most amazing part about that story is that it took her 35 years. And she's like 64 Five years times. old. I mean, this, yeah, she, it's, she never gave up. No, she no after the last time, what, four years ago, you saw, I mean, the, everybody's seen the pictures of her after she got out, after being bit by all the jellyfish. Her face was swelled up like twice the size. I mean, I know. it was awful. I mean, it was a terrible sight. And, and to want to do that again. But she did it, and she... She got through, and apparently they said this time everything was in her favor. There were no sharks. The, the, the way that the uh, Gulf Stream went didn't cause her too much trouble. The currents were in her favor, and actually that's why she got in a day early because the currents were pushing her. They said you could swim at 1.2 miles an hour. Now think about that, and relatively speaking, how slow that is. Um, but they said that she actually was being pushed by the current, so she, was, she averaged five miles an hour. Oh, that's great. Okay, so that's that's why she finished a day early. Yep, that's yep. right. Yeah, so she was expecting three days and actually got in in, uh, in in a little over two. Not to mention the energy conservation that the that the currents help you. Right. With. Yeah. Yeah. So and which which then translates into that mental energy. So when your physical energy isn't being depleted as fast as you can make it, you know, it keeps you mentally acute. Apparently, this is a little thing that, uh, you know, she said there's nothing more solitary than swimming and nothing that will cause you more mental anguish than swimming because, you're, you know, everything starts to hurt and you're in the water and you're kind of separated even if there's, there are, you know, she had boats right there. Yeah. But over and over, there's one song apparently that she hums in her head and that is Ticket to Ride by the Beatles. Oh, wow. Yeah. So apparently that's the one that just kept, that, that she, kept, she keeps going over and over in her head. Well, you know, um, I've been to a number of Daniel Stewart clinics now, and that's a really big deal in sports psychology is finding your song and singing it and repeating it and letting it drive you and letting it inspire you. And in her case, letting it keep you afloat. So what's your song? Did you figure that out? Just keep trotting. Just keep (laughs) trotting. Just keep trotting. (laughs) That's funny. I didn't know that was a song. But. It is. Well, it's it's a modified Disney <laughs> verse. It works. It works. That's funny. Well, we went to Disney over the weekend uh, for our first time back since the summer, and because we don't go over the summers, too many too many people there, and too hot. But uh, and then, of course, one of my least favorite songs in the whole world is "It's a Small World," and. You know, you can't go to Disney without hearing It's a Small World. And it just sticks in my head, and then it will never go away. I know. It won't go away. It's a small world after all. Ah! We were talking about that ride this weekend. We were telling some people that Grace and I had done Disney World by ourselves. And, of course, they asked, did you go on It's a Small World? And I was saying that we did, and we did so, like, at the end, towards the end of the day. And we were kind of tired, and you're sitting in this boat. And it's rocking gently through the ride, and it's a small world is being played over and over again. The two of us actually fell asleep. I know you will in that ride, that's for sure. <laughs> we fell asleep, and of course, because somebody said, "Did you go on It's a Small World?" Next thing you know, we're all singing it, and like a day later, we're still singing it. I know that song just oh, can't stand that one. But we do have some guests for today. We have a fun show planned. We're going to go be going around the world, actually. As the title suggests, we're going south of the equator with both guests today. Uh, We're going to be talking to C.C. Flanagan Snow, who is a photographer that's getting to do the trip of a lifetime to Bahia, Brazil. And we're going to talk to her about that and uh, what that involves. 
And then also we're doing a listener highlight, and we're doing uh, we're going to be speaking to Ellie O'Brien, who has her own training business down in Rotura, Rotura, Rot. <laughs> Somewhere in New Zealand. Somewhere she's down in New Zealand. <laughs> we won't. We won't. We just. <laughs> I don't know exactly how to say that name. But she's down there in New Zealand. So we're going to be speaking to her. She has Ellie O'Brien horsemanship. And uh, I, she sent me a video to watch. And I absolutely loved her style and how gentle she was with the horse that she was training that day. So I thought, well, let's get her on and talk a little bit. We haven't talked to any, somebody from Australia, New Zealand in quite a while. No, it's been a while. And there are good friends. We love our friends down under. We have a lot of listeners down there. So, yes, we do. Um, you know, and, and part of the reason, guys, that we don't is the time difference makes it difficult. The time of the day we record the show is like 2 in the morning down there. So we have to kind of alter the time we do our interviews to be able to interview people from Australia and New Zealand. And uh, we have to do it in our evenings here, which is the well, Although if you happen to have insomnia and you need something to do, yes. send <laughs> yeah, us we'll an email. <laughs> well, we'd love to have you on. If you're up at 3 in the morning, we'd be happy to talk to you. We'll put you to sleep. <laughs> So, yeah, so that's why we don't interview more people from down there, actually. Well, let's take a break for a commercial. and We're going to be right back after this Nutrition Minute from Kentucky Performance Products with Cece Flanagan-Snow about her trip to Brazil. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. Have you heard of Saccharomyces boulardii? It's a yeast, a type of probiotic. Often referred to as S. boulardii, it benefits your horse's digestive tract in several different ways. One unique property of S. boulardii is that it supports the stimulation of something called brush broader membrane enzymes that are found in the intestinal lining. These enzymes help your horse digest starches and sugars in the small intestine. When the sugars and starches are more completely digested, fewer of them escape into the hindgut where they can ferment and cause imbalances that lead to colic, diarrhea, and laminitis. Saccharomyces boulardii is found in Nalox Advanced, made by Kentucky Performance Products. Nalox Advanced contains a blend of yeast, fermentation solubles, and stomach buffers. These ingredients work together to maintain your horse's digestive tract in peak condition. Nalox Advanced is recommended for horses of all ages and stages and is fed on a daily basis. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. Well, hi, Cece. Welcome to the Stable Scoop Show. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. You have an exciting trip coming up, uh, but uh, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're a horse person from up there in Canada? I am. Um, I've been a rider and a riding instructor for, oh, a little longer than I'd care to describe, um, primarily in dressage the last little while. And uh, I have just re- semi-retired my most recent horse, at the age of 19, and he's still going strong. But uh, due to some physical limitations of my own, I had to stop riding myself, unfortunately. But I'm still coaching. Do you know oh, what that I... means, don't you? And good for coaching. You know what that means? That means you're <laughs> going to be taking up driving, you're going to have a dry, a cart. And... <laughs> well, the thought has crossed my mind <laughs> on more than one occasion, <laughs> for sure. We get and, a lot of people uh, into driving. I'm a driver, and we get a lot of people into driving because of that, because they just can't ride like they used to. Yeah, so, exactly. So they take up driving. At least they have something to do, you know. Or vaulting. Or vaulting. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I can't ride anymore, so I'm going to take, take up vaulting. vaulting. There you go. Oh, it sounds like a plan to me. Now, um, are you a no, photographer, I, too? Are you a professional I, photographer? Or? Yes, uh, yep. I am a professional photographer and writer. Uh, that's how I make my living. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm in Canada. I'm on the East Coast in the probably least known province of New Brunswick. Okay. Um, Beautiful spot and lots of photographic opportunities here. But I now have the opportunity, as you mentioned, to participate in Brazil on Focus, um, the workshop in Brazil. And that's just incredibly exciting. Now, yeah, you're going to be taking a trip with other photographers, I assume. 
Okay. There are actually 20 of us going, um, basically either professional or advanced amateur photographers from around the world. That I rules us out, anywhere. Helena. We can't go. <laughs> yeah. I never get to go anywhere. I'm always found Aww. out last minute. That's okay. The, this is why we have the show, so we can live vicariously through you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy the trip. You know, a couple of the things that I found interesting, you're going to be going to Bahia, which is on the east coast of uh, of Brazil. It's, it's you know, it's right on, it, it's, uh, it's the Bahia is actually uh, not right on the ocean, right? Uh, part of it is. It's on okay. the Atlantic. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, is this trip a riding trip? Are you going to be riding the, 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 while you're there? How does it work? Well, it's primarily a, photo, uh, it's a photographic workshop. And so the people that are going there, as I've mentioned, there are 20 of us and coming from around, excuse me, coming from around the world from one from Canada, which is me, four from the United States, uh, a couple from Italy. There are a couple coming from Sweden, France, uh, Germany, I think, and uh, Portugal and some from Brazil itself. So we're all going to meet up with Paula Silva, and she's the workshop leader. She's a well-known international equine photographer based in Italy. She's, the, she's going to be, she has set up this whole thing. We'll be going around to several different breed ranches within the, the state of Bahia, where the various, most of them will be Brazilian breeds that we'll be seeing, the Mangalarga Marchador and the uh, Campolinas. And then there will also be some quarter horses. They're primarily working breeds. But where we'll be going, some of these farms could have as many as 1,000 horses on them. Oh, wow. Which is just mind-boggling. And, of course, with the exotic location, the sort of tropical um, palm trees in the background, (laughs) the images we come away with hopefully will be really excellent. And, of course, we'll be being instructed by Paula as we go along with the goal of all of us improving our skills and sharing with each other as well. What types of images do you like to capture most? I mean, what do you, what, what do you like to express? When you... I'm, I'm always looking for the emotion. Whether Primarily, I'm shooting mostly people and their horses as opposed to just the horse, uh, although I do do some a fair amount of that, but my favorite thing is to get both the horse and the the owner or the rider or the handler um, interacting with each other and capturing those moments where you can actually see that, hey, there is a connection. Hmm. And so where I'm I'm guessing that as you're going through Brazil, um, it's going to be an entirely different set of emotions than what you might capture in Canada or in the U.S. I, I mean, obviously, the, or I don't know, is it? Is, is this, do you have some kind of preconceived notion of what you're going to see? Do you have expectations? My expectations are more to see the hor- horses being used in a working environment. Right. It's going to be much less, st- much less posed, much less staged than we would have you know, if I were doing a portrait of you and your horse, you know, at, at your farm or wherever your horse is kept, that's a very staged situation. And I'm expecting this to be quite different. Um, not to say that there, I'm still expecting that there will be a connection between the riders and their horses and, uh, you know, and the owners and their horses, because these are, as I mentioned, breeding, breeding farms. So I don't know. It, it's, probably going to be different than what I'm used to here. Well, yeah, especially if you've got a thousand horses in a field. That's going to uh, <laughs> that's going to going to be some really cool shots, I would assume. It blows my mind. I've I've seen pictures taken from previous workshops that others have taken, and I mean, it's such a beautiful beautiful area. And you know, many of these farms have, you know, as you would expect to find in Kentucky, you know, rows of white fencing. And, you know, mares and foals playing in the fields and those kinds of things. And when I'm shooting for myself in a manner that has nothing to do with horses, my pet thing is doing landscape photography. And so I'm hoping while I'm in Brazil, I can combine all of this. 
Well, yeah, that's and and I didn't realize that Brazil had the fifth largest population of horses in the world. I knew, you know, that there were a lot of horses. I didn't realize there were that many. Um, well, it's just well, the, yeah. I mean, lots of horses come out of there. Now, <laughs> yeah, where have you been? That's true. Glenn. Now, are you concerned at all? Is there any talk at all about? Uh, I know Brazil had some problems and have had problems recently. So, safety and security. Any concerns about that? Or I think basically we will be as safe as anyone can be traveling anywhere. Okay. Um, you know, you have to exercise some common sense. And for example, I'm, my camera gear is worth a fair amount of money. That's what I was thinking is you've got 20 people here with a very expensive camera equipment. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and it just common sense says that, you know, when we're in, in cities, we'll be in Sao Paulo and Salvador. Um, it wouldn't be smart to walk around the streets with cameras hanging off our necks. Yeah. Um, you know, you kind of put those things away or at a site and, um, you know, we're, we'll be given itineraries of our travels from ranch to ranch. And, uh, you know, we've already been told there's certain places, don't go here, don't go there. Um, stay on the marked routes that you're given and, um, you know, places that are safe to stop for a meal or whatever. Um, the, the things that we've seen in the media early, basically earlier in the summer when there were some uprisings and yeah, you know, demonstrations. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of, yeah. Um, they were kind of protesting the the soccer, the money that was being spent on the World Soccer Tournament. Yes. And uh, I talked to a couple of the, actually, ladies that are going to be in the group that are from Brazil itself and asked them, you know, are you concerned? Are you Are you safe? And they said, as is typical anywhere, in the, me- the media picks on the most violent, the most you know, dramatic thing to report upon. And in reality, there's very little of it. There, there was very little violence. There was very little, um, you know, people would take their grandmothers and their children and go to these protests and, um, you know, express themselves. But, you know, it was just a few idiots that became violent and caused So it's like any other protest sort of anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and any other media coverage yeah. of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And of course Rio so. is the home to the Olympics coming up in 2016 too, so Exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, this is going to be exciting. I uh, I would hope that uh we we could get to talk to you after so we can hear how this uh how this goes. It'd be it'd be fun to hear how it went and and uh, all the different things you got to see. It's going to be terrific. The um one of the things I should mention that we're doing every year that Paula has done these workshops, the group has chosen a local charity to support okay. as a result of being in the area. This last year it was a children's hospital. This year it's a home for seniors for um, home for the aged, and these are indigent people who really have no other resources, um, and they're very elderly and they need support. So what we will do at the end of the the two-week uh, workshop. We'll be holding a photo- photographic expedition, exhibition, sorry, in uh, Salvador itself. And the images, each of us will donate a couple of our best shots, and they'll be printed and available for sale in the exhibit. When it's finished in Brazil, we'll be sending the exhibit around to the home countries of each of the participants, and each of us will host an exhibit. So I'll host one here in, in New Brunswick. And again, the photos will be for sale, and the proceeds will be sent back to the. Um, the I can't. I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce the name of the place, <laughs> but the the, um, the home for the agent that we're going to be supporting. Terrific. So it's sort of our way of giving back. And the other thing that we're doing is a thing called Photo Dreamers, and basically we're encouraging people from our again our home areas to. Uh, Sign up on Google Plus because it's free, and it works similarly to Skype. That um, they'll be able to reach us on our cell phones. We're going to set up a schedule and say, okay, certain time of the day. Um, they'll be able to connect with us, and we can show them what we see. And the people that we are inviting to this are people who have an interest in horses, have an interest in photography and travel, and for whether it's an illness or it's a physical disability, they are unable to do something like this. So this is their chance uh, to be virtual photographers with us. Oh, that's a cool idea. Talk about using technology. Absolutely, and giving back. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, we're, uh, you know, for the last year, we've been all getting to know each other through Facebook, actually. And um, it's a pretty generous group, and it's a pretty caring group that's going. And, I mean, everybody is into this. Let's involve as many people as possible, because it's a way of sharing the culture that we find when we go to Brazil as well. Well, I think it's terrific. We're going to catch up with you in a few weeks. You have a great time down there, and we can't wait to see the pictures. Well, thank you very much. Well, there's a trip for you, Helena. Although you and I, neither of us would be that good at photography. They would never invite us. Maybe someday. You never know. I could be the water boy, carry the water. Okay. You know, just <laughs> I don't know what I would do. I, I could either. carry the lens. I couldn't really. I'd lose things. Yeah, that's true. You would. I would just. I would be that commentary. Nobody's going to trust you with their five thousand dollar camera equipment. Oh my god! I can't. No, it's true. <laughs> I'll just. I could cheer people on. I can do the whoop whoop. Yeah, that's. <laughs> that's, that's about it. We're talkers. We're not. Uh, we're, we're not doers. I was going to say we're talkers. We're not doers. The that's only funny. thing that I might be able to do is if we got ourselves into a pickle, I might be able to talk, talk us, us out, out of it. it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, that's fun. We're, we're going to definitely get her back after the trip and find out how that went. But what a dream come true to get to see the horses down there. Can you imagine a thousand horses on the beautiful landscape, you know, of Brazil? So that 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 would be neat and something that you would never get to see anywhere else. No, absolutely. I like that. I would like to get down there someday. I would. Speaking of beautiful country, one of them is, that is absolutely beautiful and a place that I would like to get to sometime is New Zealand. It's on the top of my list, Australia, New Zealand. We have a lot of listeners from Australia, New Zealand. I have a lot of friends that live in New Zealand that I've met over the years. Some of them that I met actually through when I was playing competitive backgammon. Um, oh, and- hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> yes. Just back <laughs> it up. Yes. <laughs> something you didn't know <laughs> i have mentioned it i think i, I mentioned this? it on the morning show once that uh, i was actually one of the top 20 players in the world at one time okay let, how do i put this all right maybe i can spell it d-o-r-k <laughs> no no it's g-e-e-k see that's why i'm glenn the geek I do that is awesome side. though competitive back i i actually i i tease you because i love you but um <laughs> you were one of the top 20 players in the world it's like chess you know backgammon chess it's yes. these are all games of, of yes. mental energy yeah so let me just ask you one question yes why do you no longer play competitive backgammon I, you know i did it when i was really sick and online uh we, i belong to the international backgammon club and we uh, we did tournaments and everything, and, and a lot of that's done online now. They don't even get together anymore. Uh, matter of fact, we would joke that we wouldn't know how to set up a board if we got together. We wouldn't know where the pieces went because we just <laughs> it's all electronic. It's all done for you. So um, uh, you know, so I played a lot and uh, just got better and better and better. You know, I like those kind of mind things anyway. So uh, and it, when I was really sick, it helped keep my mind sharp, and that was one of the reasons that I did it. But I got to know a lot of people from around the world, including New Zealand, and still talk to some of those people today on Facebook on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of neat. Because we used to do team backgammon as well and used to compete against each other, and I had a team that included a couple New Zealanders. Okay, so just remind me not to... uh... Not to bring up backgammon at, like, Thanksgiving or something. Oh, I'll play you. That won't be a problem. We can put a little wager down. A little wager (laughs) down? I'm not good at it. You'll kick my hiney. Why do you think I'm saying that, Alina? Oh, yeah. (laughs) You just... Now, you know, what's funny, though, is uh, I, I, it's been so long since I played now. It's been a couple of years. I don't know if I'd remember how. I'd have, to, uh, I'd have to brush up on it again. Yeah, especially if money was involved. You'd brush up pretty quick, I bet. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I don't trust you. You gamers, man. All right, New Zealand. So we're going to have a listener on. Her name is Ellie O'Brien. She runs Ellie O'Brien Horsemanship, and she's out of Rotorua, New Zealand. And we'll find out how to say that. That's the first thing we're going to find out how to do. <laughs> and we're going to talk to her about uh, about her life down there with horses and learn a little bit about the area that she lives in. So let's talk to Ellie. Right after this word from Equisketch. Glenn the Geek here. The life of horse person is hard enough, and we all hate doing the required paperwork, and unfortunately many of us never get around to it, and it just piles up on our desk. That is about to change thanks to the Equisketch Records app for your iPhone or iPad. My wife and I use it to track our horses, and we absolutely love this thing. 
EquiSketch Records is the most thorough and complete equestrian records app on the market today. We love this app because you can track your farrier work, your dental, your Coggins, medicines, worming, and so much more. And you can get reminders on your device when all of these things are due. You'll never forget a worming or shots or farrier visit again. But it not only tracks your horse, you can also manage your horse shows, including individual events. You can manage riders, including lessons and memberships and so much more. And you can sync it between your iPhone and your iPad and all of this for the price of a couple of cups of coffee from Starbucks. Search for EquiSketch Records in the iOS App Store or go to EquiSketch.com. That's E-Q-U-I-S-K-E-T-C-H.com. EquiSketch.com. Well, hi, Ellie, and welcome to the Stable Scoop Show. Hi, Glenn. Nice to talk to you. Well, it's good to talk to you, too. Now, we we are loving doing these segments where we're getting to know our listeners and people from around the world, and we have a bunch of listeners in New Zealand, so we're glad to have you on. Awesome. I'm, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> now, I've been messing up the name of your town. Is it Rotur? I can't say it. <laughs> this is a tricky one. Not a lot of people can get it. It's um, Rotorua. Rotorua. Yeah. Okay. Or... Were, there were like too many U's and stuff in it. It was like, <laughs> can we make that simpler? But okay, Rotorua. And what part of New Zealand is that in? North Island, South Island? Yep. So we're in the North Island and um, we're kind of, uh, our area is called the Bay of Plenty. I love that name, the Bay of it's... Plenty. Mm-hmm, pretty good. <laughs> is it the Bay of Plenty? It definitely is. <laughs> now, you know, I haven't been to New Zealand, but we have I have a bunch of friends that live in New Zealand and, of course, have seen the videos and pictures and everything. Awesome. Is, is it uh, as beautiful as, as it looks? I think so. It, it, we've got a lot of green, and we're so lucky to have a lot of things right on our doorstep. I mean, we live about half an hour away from the beach and two hours away from the mountains, and we've got a lot of lakes around and lots of green. <laughs> now, are you are you in a horsey area? Uh, so I sort of, my own home is in a town. We have like lots of neighbors around, which is a little bit different for me, but, um, my, the ranch where I keep all of my horses and run my business from is about 15 minutes away. Um, so we're like really lucky that, uh, land or horses are accessible within five to 10 minutes sort of driving time. And did you grow up with horses? Is this something that uh, you've had since you were a kid? Yep, it definitely has been. Um, my father's family, they had, uh, I don't know if you do it over there, but um, they had pig hunting horses. So uh, as children, we would get to sit on the on the big Clydesdales and ride them around. And I can remember having a sack for a saddle to sit on and a rope for a bridle. <laughs> <laughs> but um we seem to seem to work, and we didn't have too many accidents. Well, from the video I saw, which is why I contacted you in the first place, was a video of a horse that you were working with. You've gone backwards because now you don't even have the bridle in the saddle. So <laughs> I know it's <laughs> <laughs> a little bit odd. <laughs> but, um, it, I really love it. There's, I think there's no feeling like that being able to work with a horse with um, you know no gear on it. Now you you uh, obviously have some uh, training in natural horsemanship from the from the video I did see, mm-hmm. and wh- so who you know who who are your inspirations? Who'd you learn from growing up? Well, um, I guess my childhood, I sort of did the pony club thing, and I spent it, um, my ten now, years. So before you go on from there, is pony club yep. as big there as it is in in England? Uh, yeah, it is really big. It's sort of like what um, most of the kids do um, from the age of about five to 17 or so. And then they all sort of move on and start um, doing registered competing and all of that sort of stuff. And when you were in Pony Club, were you eventing or? Uh, so I, um, I was in Pony Club until I was about 13 or 14 and I did um 
a whole range of things from ribbon days to dressage, show jumping, a little bit of low level eventing and um, I did some barrel racing. So it was really neat. We got to experience like all of the disciplines really. How did you go then from Pony Club into what you're doing now, which is which is a, a good bit of training and things? Yeah, well, um, in my teen years, well, actually, I think all of my life, I sort of had horses and ponies that were young or may have had problems, and I guess it was just something that I had always worked with, so... Um, and I really enjoyed it. I love seeing those improvements that you can get, and um, I guess just a bit of a connection going on with with your horse. So after I I um, competed competed in show jumping through my teen years, and came to a bit of a sticky end, having a bad fall and fracturing my neck. Okay. So <laughs> after that, I kind of thought, well. I've really got to look at what I'm doing and how I'm doing it and started researching trainers and I came across um, Buck Brandman, of course, and uh-huh. Ray Hunt and um, the likes. So, And I just loved their way of working with them. So I've just sort of followed their work online and reading and watching things a lot on YouTube as well. And um, I've been pretty fortunate to spend some time with some really neat horsemen as well. Well, you... Um obviously learning from the, the, the best of the best in the natural horsemanship field. And I could tell watching your video just how patient you were and how quiet you were with the horses. Thank you. Um, that, that, that came through. And I was wondering because, uh, you know, obviously there aren't as many clinics where you are as there are here. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't know if uh, how exactly. But the Internet makes that so nice now. I mean, uh, yep. you can get all of that on YouTube. Yeah, I know. We're, we're pretty lucky how accessible the information is now. And I guess it makes it achievable for any person as well, which is great. What do you find? Are there challenges living in New Zealand? Are there things that uh, working with the horses that you go, oh, this would be so much easier if I lived somewhere else, you know, England, United States? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess uh, here... Uh, horses in equestrian is very much a hobby and everyone sort of seems to have their horse in their backyard and kind of like a do-it-yourself mentality so to do it professionally it is kind of hard and it's um, a little bit trickier to get the clientele but um, it's still it's a great lifestyle and I really enjoy it here. You, you're running a business now are you training horses is that the main impetus or lessons or what kind of business? Yep. Um, so mostly I start, I start horses. I get um, quite a few restarts and problems, and I also do lessons with riders as well. Okay, so now let me, let me back up here. You quit mm-hmm. jumping because you broke parts, and now you're starting horses. I'm not <laughs> yep. sure that you went to the safer route here. <laughs> well, I guess um, now that I'm more aware of what my horse is doing and what I'm doing, um, I probably wouldn't have had quite so many accidents when I was younger. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I actually, I haven't had many things go wrong while it, since I've been starting horses, which has been really good. <laughs> so do you watch things? We're a, we're a media sponsor this year for Road to the Horse. Uh, yeah. And I, that must be something that you look at and, and uh, you really take a look at, especially seeing that uh, we had some winners from Down Under the last two years. Yeah, very cool. Um, I'm actually good friends with Dan James. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so he's Dan's kind been of on the show a number of times. Yeah, oh, well, that's awesome. And um, so he's been a bit of an inspiration for me, I guess. And um, I I would hope to be at that level one day. Well, one day we'll have you over here at the Kentucky Horse Park. <laughs> I wouldn't say no to that. <laughs> we need more women anyway. I mean, I know. <laughs> we've, we've had a few. We have had a few. Last year we had uh, some women in the competition, but we definitely need to bring more women into the picture. That's fantastic. So, um, and now you can watch it online, so it makes it, you can actually, you know, experience Road of the Horse right from home. Yeah, I don't have to fly all the way over. (laughs) This will be my first year actually going. We've been covering it as an event, Uh, but this will be my first year that I actually get to go and and watch it in person. I'm very excited about it. That'll, That'll be coming up in March of next year at the Kentucky Horse Park. That'll be a great experience. 
So now you, what, when people bring horses to you, uh, you know, whether it's for, for breaking or retra- mostly for retraining, what, what are the problems that you, you see? What are the most, what's the most common thing that you're seeing a horse come to you and do you find it's the horse or do you find it's the person? Um, well, I guess probably as most trainers would say, there are um, usually people problems. Yeah. Um, so, so that's and- no different in New Zealand either, huh? Yeah, <laughs> different, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think just it's quite often just small problems like um, that have been overlooked earlier on in training and then it sort of got snowballed and got bigger and bigger. Um, so we just go back to the start and work through things and it kind of turns out that they're not such a big problem after all. Do you encourage them to take lessons then at that point before you give the horse back? Yes, I um, I say to my clients like that they're welcome to come out whenever they want, and I, I like them to out spend as much time as possible to see how it works and get an understanding of what's going on. And before the horse goes home, then I get them out and give them some lessons and walk them through everything and show them how they can carry on with the training as well. Yeah, because you know if you're sending them home to the same situation that they came from, uh, yeah. you know you. you the the fear is that you're just going to be getting them back in three months. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And that is something, you know, I kind of always think about as well. So I try really hard to keep in contact with the people after they've gone home. And I say, if you're having any problems, don't hesitate to call me and, um, you know, we can work things out. Breeds of horses, what do you see the most in where you are in New Zealand? Well, I get a lot of, we have a lot of crossbreeds, um, so uh, the warm bloods are quite popular here, and they're quite often crossed with a thoroughbred, or we kind of get lots of mixes, like um, Clydesdales, it's kind of a bit of a mixing pot really, but we seem to produce some really great horses. <laughs> I'm looking at your, your Skype image, and you're on, I don't know what you would call that color. Is it a cream? It's a very large, uh, has to be a cross with a draft of something. Yep. She, yeah, she was a um, Clydesdale. I think she might have had some quarter horse in there somewhere. Well, what, a, what a great color, though. It's really, really light sort of cream color with the with the dark mane and, and uh, legs. Yes, yep, she was a sweet at. So that horse there, I think she had been started for about four weeks. So. She has a very kind mare. I love the drafts. Drafts are my favorite breeds because of that. They're just, you know, they're yeah. so easy to work. You can train them in no time. Yeah. Uh, and they tend to retain what they've learned. Yes, they're very smart. Well, I guess, um, you know, they had a job to do. Or they were bred for doing a working job, and um, they've definitely got the temperament for it. And the most difficult breeds to work with? Um, I would say it would have to be um, the thoroughbreds, not because of themselves, but I think um, especially when they've come from a racing industry, that does make it a little bit difficult. Yeah, I mean, there's just we we've talked about that a lot. The OTTBs and and uh, retraining them and how it yeah. and that's what my wife did for years. Okay. Uh, and you just have to you have to think like they do and appreciate what they've been through. Yeah, that's right. Yep. I mean, it's not like taking a horse that's, uh, you know, that has lived in a barn in a field and had no experience. Uh, th- yep. This horse has had experiences that you have to take into account. Yeah, and just take your time. Now, I also do the driving radio show. Is uh, are kids carriage driving big in your area at all? Uh we do. I mean, there is. There are people doing it. It's something that I haven't actually looked into a lot, um, but it's not huge. I would yeah. say our, our biggest things are eventing, jumping, and dressage. Is Western reining getting popular like it is in Europe right now? It is pretty popular, but still the same. That It's not big or right. anything. Yet. We just don't have the, the number of people, I think. Yeah. And or, nor the Western Saddles, apparently. <laughs> the Western Saddles. <laughs> you can't beat a comfortable Western Saddle. <laughs> yeah, this is the girl who rides bareback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this is great. Where can people find out more about you and what you do and, and see pictures and stuff? 
Uh, well, I have a Facebook page, a fan page, which is Ali O'Brien Horsemanship. And I sort of try to keep that updated regularly with photos and tips and just little blogs about horses that I'm working with. So it's it's fun. Well, we appreciate you being on. It's always nice to get to know our friends in other countries and especially in Australia. New Zealand is now our third largest listening audience. It now has exceeded uh, England and the U.K., Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, so United States and Canada is second, and then uh, Australia and New Zealand is third. And and, uh, so we have a lot of listeners there, and we really appreciate our listeners there. And and thank you for representing. No problem. My pleasure. Well, now it is time for our Tech and Habits segment. This Tack and Habit segment is sponsored by Sparkle and Boom. Sparkle and Boom is a new media marketing company. Our mission is to help small businesses add some sparkle to their marketing in order to get some boom in their bottom line. Our creativity, combined with an extensive background in the equestrian industry, makes us perfectly suited to help your business capture the potential of social media and the ever-changing World Wide Web. Visit us online at www.sparkleandboom.com. This week's Tack and Habit segment features one of my favorite all-time riders and competitors, Gina Miles. Gina is going to be talking to us about a line of bits that she's developed in partnership with Professionals Choice. And it was an added bonus that we actually got to see her in person at the American Equestrian Trade Association a couple of weeks ago. We didn't ca- we we didn't know she was going to be there, so it we was, didn't. It was a pleasant surprise, and so I could have fun. talked to her. You know, I was like, "Damn, we only have ten minutes. I could talk to her for ten <laughs> hours about bidding." And of course, she is an Olympic eventer for those that, for those few people that don't know who Gina Miles is. She's Olympic a medal winning Olympic eventer. Yes, out of California. No joke. Gina Miles is no joke, people. And one of our favorite guests. Yes. Well, Helene and I are here at the American Equestrian Trade Association show. Thanks to Hopper Expositions for bringing us in with another Tack and Habit segment. And we're so excited about this because one of our first guests ever, 4,200 guests ago (laughs) on the Horse Radio Network, was Gina Miles. And now we're sitting here with her here in person. Gina, I ought to say, I never thought I'd run into you at a trade show in Philadelphia. Well, here I am. (laughs) Straight from California. 16 canceled flights later, I finally made it. Oh, I heard you made it late last (laughs) night, too. Yes, it was a bit of an adventure. But who knew you could have weather problems in San Francisco and Phoenix? (laughs) Fog in San Francisco, heat in Phoenix, and there you go. Oh, there, happy well, to be we're here. We're so glad to see you in person again. <laughs> it's so much fun. Actually, Gina was one of our Helena and I's first yeah, guests. Yeah, like the third guest. Yes, Gina was like our third guest on the show, and you were right off of your silver medal win in the Olympics. Ah, excellent. And yeah. I was like, <coughs> what do you ask an Olympian? Like, he's like, oh, you lead this. You like her. You know, you're a fan of her. And we, we were only, really, it was like three shows in. We yeah. Like, what we Doing, no, we had and no you idea. made it really easy. Oh, good. I'm glad. We had no that listeners then either. We had, <laughs> that, that makes it easy, right? Yeah, right that exactly. makes it easy. I was like, it was a little bit awkward at first, but then we started talking about McKinley. Yeah. I really want to learn about him. Yeah. I thought he was just the greatest, and you were grooving on him. And I think once we started talking about him, we all got comfortable. All got good at it, yeah. And I yeah. think Gina's been a guest about 100 times on, on all, almost all the different mm-hmm, shows mm-hmm. since then. But now you actually have something that you want to talk about. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, I've been working with Professionals Choice on a bit line. Um, bidding has sort of been my passion from, I can remember I was a working student for Brian Sabo and walking into his tack room at Hurtledale and there's a whole wall of bits. And he knew about every single bit and what this bit did and what that bit did. And it was such a fascination for me that there was so much about bidding to learn. And that really continued on um, riding with Jimmy Wofford and, and being on the East Coast and, and learning about horses and training from Jimmy and sort of his philosophies. Um, and also with George Morris. As a three-day eventer, I spend a lot of time cross-training in, in the dressage and the show jumping disciplines. And so getting sort of that feedback and perspective, um, I just have always had a real passion for it. So when Dal Scott, um, the owner of Professionals Choice, pro- 
uh, approached me with the idea of a bit line, it just, it was a natural fit. You know, I'm really, um, my goal was to educate people more about bidding. A lot of times I see people out there in a, in a fad bit, the latest, greatest, and they have no idea what it does. And so for me to try to help educate people about what bits do and, and get the most performance out of their horse was, was my goal. So when you, when you switch between disciplines as a three-day eventer, same horse, do you change bits depending on what you're doing? Um, absolutely. Now, um, you know, one of my basic philosophies is to try to go in the simplest bit possible. So if I can ride in, your, in the basic double ring snaffle that I have for all three phases, that's my first choice. And, and then I try to get, if I have a new student, a new horse comes into the bar, and that's what I want to put them in, is I have a, a really basic loose ring, um, double jointed, snaffle um, that's legal for dressage and we start everybody in that and that's sort of our starting point you know where are we where what's the communication Um, does the horse listen where are the problems and and then we go from there so if you have um, let's say you have a horse who's just really strong in the bit hard to rate whether Mm -hmm. it's it's control out in the open cross country or even in the ring what would be the next thing that you would go up to well, if it's just a, if it's just a lot of energy. Yeah, you know. yeah. Well, and I, I'm actually I worked on putting together um, a bit guide. So I actually wrote a, a guide that's going to go along with the bits um, to help explain some of these things because it's so that's such that's a like conf- a free lesson from Gina. Exactly, yeah, that, exactly. That it's, normally <laughs> cost you ten thousand dollars, but twenty. Gonna, it just went up to twenty. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know. Um, every once in a while, he catches on, and then we have to be careful. Then um, we just turn his volume down. <laughs> um, but it, it actually it has it, that is so much to that because there's different types of mouthpieces that you can go to. So you can change the action of the mouthpiece to either go more gentle or more severe based on what you put in the mouth. And then there's also the cheek pieces. So there's a lot of, um, whether you're going to a full cheek or a loose ring or a D ring, there's a lot involved in the cheek pieces. Uh, Whether you start to go to leverage. So we get into the the realm of leverage bits. And then you have to look at, okay, well, is my horse strong because he goes too high? Does he put his head up in the air and he's hollow backed? Or does he bear down? Does he, you know, lean down and go too low? Or does he act like he swallowed a two by four and he's completely not locked in the head and the, and the neck. And that's going to determine what I go to um, and affect. And that's kind of what I explain in the bidding guide about, you know, what is it that your horse does? So he runs off with you, but does he go down too low? If he goes down too low, we need to be looking at a gag type bit. So I've got a, a W gag that's really good for cross country and horses that run way too low um, versus the signature bit, which I'm really excited about. We was so excited to get this one out there finally. It's this double ring um, uh, Waterford. So it's got a Waterford mouthpiece. So it can be very mild for a young horse. So if you have a kind of a green young horse and you don't want to go too strong or overbid them, and you use even pressure, the Waterford's really gentle. But because it's got two rings, so the cheek piece attaches to one ring and the reins to the other, there's no fixed point of contact. So the horse cannot lean on it. There is literally no fixed point Isn't that one of for your the horse to bits lean on. Anyway? Oh, all-time favorite so. bit. Yeah. All-time favorite Explain bit. Explain a little bit about, about how a Waterford functions, because functions, it's my favorite, too, but I don't know why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just well, know it's gentle it's, and it's soft. Exactly. Um, because, uh, the most gentle mouthpiece you can use is a mullen mouth, right? So just one solid, Straight. smooth piece across the horse's mouth. Um, and so your, your Waterford can act like a mullen mouth if you use even contact on both reins. So if you have completely even contact, it just makes that Waterford go into one solid piece. So it's really gentle on the horse's tongue which is why it's good for young horses. But if they start to lean or brace or run off with you, it instantly by moving the bit around in the mouth, you can change it into five different pieces. It's got the five different pieces on it. So you can break them up, loosen them, stop them from bolting or, or leaning and running off with you, and then go right back to the smooth so it's like pressure. like a whole training toolkit in their mouth right there. Exactly. So, so if you know how to use it properly, it can. it's like a little toolkit. Exactly. So we've taken the Waterford can and we've... Can you see the light bulb going off over <laughs> my head? That's why you love it. So we've taken the Waterford and by adding the double rings, we've taken that one step further. Um, so still with a young horse, it's still going to be as gentle as you want the Waterford to be, but the strongest horse I've ever ridden cross country in my life. Now, like the one that would pull and take off like a freight train. If I put more like a strong bit in her mouth, she would, she hated it. She'd hop up and down. And we get a lot of thoroughbreds in eventing that don't like strong bits and they need more control. But if you go to more bit, the horse just hates it, you know? Um, but they don't resent this because it's got that gentle mouthpiece. And then it's got the two rings. So your rein is attached separately from where your cheek pieces are. And when they go to lean on you, you can move that around. If, if they're 
little low, it can have a slight gag effect. If they're a little hollow, you can really supple them in the pole and the jaw and get them to drop and relax their back. And it's like magic control. I mean, it really, it, 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 we can put it on 80% of the horses in the barn and have it be a, be a, a, a solution, you know, solving the problems. What makes your di- bits different than everybody else's? That's a question you're going to get over and over yeah, again. Yeah, of course. Um, well, we do have some very basic bits that are very similar to, you know, what you'll find on the market. We've got a slow twist. We've got the double ring. Um, I think because they're manufactured by Professionals Choice, we know that it's really high quality. Um, you know, Professionals Choice, uh, it, that's one of their really main goals is to have super high quality products at a really competitive price. Um, so, you know, you're getting, you know, you look at the, our price points and it's, um, it's very competitive and it's super high quality. And then we've added some of the specialty in there, some of the things that you don't have out there. One of the bits actually back in McKinley's early days um, that Brian Sabo had brought over from England was this W gag. And, um, and I had ridden McKinley cross country in that, like around the two star level. And I couldn't buy one, you know, I wanted to buy one. I, I had some students that tried it and you couldn't find it in this country. Yeah. That's not your normal gag. Yeah. Bit no, there. no, no. And so we came up with the W mouthpiece and we've got it both in the gag bit for cross country, as well as a full cheek, which is more traditional for your hunter jumper. You know, if you're going to go in the hunter ring or the Eck ring, you know, you need to have a more classical full cheek type cheek piece. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times you'd see like the double twisted wire, which maybe is a little more harsh yeah. than what you'd want to do so we've got the smooth mouthpiece on that so it's a little smoother a little kinder um, but still having a little bit of an elevation kind of bump that horse up off the contact still appropriate for the equitation hunter ring so what's the W? How does that function, the W? So effects? the W is like two different snaffle pieces. It's you know hard to describe without seeing it in person. But if you, if you think of the, the action of a double-twisted wire, if you've seen that, you've got the two different snaffle pieces. Yep. But they're offset, so it creates multiple points of pressure on the horse's tongue. Okay. Yeah. So And when you add multiple points of contact on the tongue, you get a quicker reaction. Okay. So it's a, um, a little bit sharper, a little more reactive. If you need a horse to respond quicker with less rain pressure, those multiple points of contact are going to give you that reaction. So good for the jumper ring great for the jumper ring um, more traditional look yep. you know um, you don't usually you don't see a gag bit in the Eck ring or the hunter ring but you know, gotta go with a full cheek or a D ring so um, more traditional more control also yeah. really good for, for um, cross country and hunting too you know if you've got a horse that, that goes down too low I know people go to a gag really quick mm. um, the problem with gags is you can get horses too hollow and inverted um, so I, I'm careful about the gags especially with a less experienced rider but going to something like the W you, um, gets the horse to, to pick up his head and his neck and not bear down without having to go to the leverage action of the gag. That's really important when you're moving out at a clip, especially on uneven terrain. Like you're going down rocky footing and up here in the northeast, you never know what you're going to get in terms of footing. And uh, Yeah. Like, Please just lift your head just lift your head up. Go to your hands too much. Exactly. You know, really screwing with them. Exactly. But if you've got just a little bit more there in the mouth, um, it can just get a really quick reaction. Pick that head and neck up. Be in a balance where you're safe. Yes. And you get the head and neck up. The haunches go down, um, and off you go. All right. So what do you have for those dressa- for the dressage the phase? dressage riders? Yeah. We have a wonderful um, basic double. We call the double break snaffle. Um, it's double jointed. It's smooth across the middle. It's a loose ring. So again, you've got the added suppling. Very, your very classic, basic day to day training bit, legal for the dressage ring. Horses love it. It's a good diameter. You know, I think you go too thick sometimes, and a horse with a small palate's going to resent it. You go too thin, it's too harsh. a little harsh. So it's a nice medium thickness. It's a good weight. You know, sometimes you hold those snaffles, and you can get a feel for how it's going to sit in your horse's mouth based on the weight. So it's just a good blend, a good weight, a good size. Good and, classic. of course, the most important thing is Gina's from California. She always looks good. Every place she goes, are the bits good looking like you, oh, Gina? Beautiful. <laughs> they, they fit right in with classic our California, beauty. you know, exactly. A little bit of shine on that California bits. sunshine, a little <laughs> bling. Well, you know, it's, it, what I like about it, you said, is a lot of, there's a lot of trendy bits, and people will put things in their horse's mouth, and they don't know why. This really, this collection sort of represents what you said when we started out the show, which is... Starting out with the simplest bit mm-hmm. possible. And this, these are just very basic, simple things. So right. you can accomplish a lot 
with very simple bits. Exactly. Is what you're exactly. And what I like to do, um, because I have children too, and I appreciate you're out fox hunting, you're sending your child out on cross country, you want them to be safe, you want them to have control. And so I, I'm all about that. You know, you need to put something stronger for the competition, great. Then come home, put something simpler in, and work on getting better at home and getting more communication, riding more from your leg in your seat, um, mild bit at home, and then maybe you still need to, and then you get to the point where, oh, oh my gosh, I actually don't need that bit anymore because I've actually trained my horse, which yes. is what I think is the goal. <laughs> Going right back to the simplest of simple. Exactly. So I kind like of a her. cycle. <laughs> Where can people find them, Gina? Um, so Professionals Choice is carrying the bits, and they're in um, all stores that carry Professionals Choice products, and you can order directly from the website, Professionals Choice, uh, as well. Good. Thank Good. you, Gina Miles. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, there you go. It's always fun to catch up with Gina. And she, you know, she's always so gracious. Every time we've been to Rolex or any place where she is, she will come over for an interview. She always stops and says hi. And, you know, she's just so terrific about it all. And she's she's full of so much positive, enthusiastic energy. And she loves to share her knowledge. She has there isn't a shred of ego in there. When you you know how we always say there's people that when they walk into a room, they have a certain aura, you know, yeah. that there, there's this positive aura that's around them and, and, and you know, they're in the room. They don't have to say a word. They walk in the room, you know, they're there. And that's the way Gina is. It's magnetism. Yeah. It definitely. is pure magnetism and she's got it. When we owned the acting company, that's one of the things. And by the way, you can't teach that. I mean, that's not something people learn. You either have it or you don't. And when we had the acting company, we always, you know, we would work on those skills, but boy, you know, you either had it or you didn't when it, when it comes to that kind of, that kind of magnetism, that's a good word that you used, um, you know, for when, you know, certain characters would, or, or if you're an actor, when you walked in a room, can you command the room without saying a word, you know, and that's yeah. the good ones do. Uh, the good ones do. You know. Sometimes the bad ones do too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or evil. <laughs> yeah, get your evil on. But if you think about it, you know, that is true. That is very true. And Well, that's good. I'm glad we got to catch up. And, of course, you can find her line of bits there. Just uh, go, go on to Professionals Choices website. Well, be sure to log on next Friday for another Stable Scoop episode where I don't know. Oh, next week. I, I tell you what uh, is happening next week, Helena. And oh, I don't know that you're you prepared. Yes, and I don't you even think happening? I told you yet. Um, our friend Kat from Eat Your Tart Out is going to come on the whole show with us. She's going to co-host the show with us next week, and she's setting up the guest. It's a whole show about food, <gasps> and she's setting up guests that are horse people who also have a relationship to the food industry, like they own a restaurant or something like that. So it should be a very interesting day. We're combining the two. Hey, you better eat before we do that show. I know. <laughs> I thought about that, actually. You won't be able to talk. You'll be <laughs> slobbering all over yourself. So Kat was, Kat was kind enough to arrange it. She's getting the guests lined up, and it should be a lot of fun. I didn't even get a chance to tell you about it yet. So. No, I know. I, what else is new? I'm always the last to know. I don't know until we log on and we start taping. That's yeah, true. Most of the time <sighs> she doesn't. But no, but that's, uh, that's what's coming up next week. So look for it here on Stable Scoop. Excellent. I'm excited. And of course, where, like, where can people find your new show? People can find my new show at ChasingAFox.com. You can follow us on Facebook, which is where a lot of the fun happens as well. Just search for Chasing a Fox. We have a bunch of good guests lined up. We're going to talk to some uh, some really interesting and colorful people uh, about fox hunting and about fashion. Very good. And, of course, you can find all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at HorseRadioNetwork.com or on our app at the iOS store or the Android store. Just search for Horse Radio Network. And I'm just checking. Your new show's not there yet, but it's supposed to be in the next couple of days. We're, we were waiting for approvals. It's been submitted. On uh, iTunes? Yeah, on, on uh, Android and iOS. Okay. So as soon as they approve it, then the, it just takes a little longer with the apps to get That's changes right. made. So, But you are on iTunes. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you just search for Chasing a Fox on iTunes, your new show is there. So you can uh, you can find it there. So it's popping up. It's coming in. And of course, Blaze Kids Radio had their second episode come out. So if you want to take and listen to that, you can also find it at horseradionetwork.com. Many thanks to our sponsors, Kentucky Performance Products and Equisketch. We appreciate them being here for us as well. Well, that's it, Helena, for this week. That is plenty, but there will be more next week. Until then, happy scooping. Hey, you did it! Took you 250 episodes, but you finally got the end right. <laughs> well, because you set me up. <laughs> it's all my You fault. did it right. Well, good Sweet. job, Helena. 
Thank you, Glenn. Remind me to pay you this week. <laughs> All right, I will. <laughs>